We're going to start this off by putting together a Craig bench. This is a 64 by 64 bench, and that'll be the base for our machine. I have one of these on my other bench, and it works pretty good. Then we had to clear out this entire corner to kind of make room for it, and we're not exactly sure where it's all going to go, so we're going to hang up this dust collection on the wall. We went with the Dust Ripe by Rockler. We have a cheaper version on our other machine, and it works pretty good. But this one actually has like a built-in filter on it, so it actually collects the fine dust. I didn't look at the instructions at all, and it was just kicking my butt. And Jess and Manny came at the perfect time to help me out. Big ol' belly! Oh. I just needed a quick set of extra hands just to tighten these screws while holding this thing up. It was just kind of cumbersome and hard to hold. I absolutely hate dealing with sheet goods. Hats off to all you people that cut these on a regular basis, but get one of these little grabby tool things. They are wonderful and they really help wrestling stuff around the shop or out of the truck. And then you have to add these supports in the middle just because it's a large area and you don't want that top to sag and these will also help make it a little more rigid and less wobbly. The machine has a four x four cut area, but the actual machine sits a little wider than that. So I went with a one inch overhang and went with 66 by 66 for the top. I then ripped down these 2x4s and notched them with this jig so that it would sit flush with the top of the rail as there's a little bit of a lip there. Since the bench is 64x64, 64 64, I just couldn't get sheets big enough, so unfortunately there's going to be a seam and I had to rip down two sheets of plywood. And then to help with rigidity and keeping dust out of the bottom, I added these side panels. This will also give me something to mount all the electronics to. So we finally got the bench together. So I'm gonna start getting the machine put together. Jess got super sick and she's stuck on the couch with the dog. So I'm gonna try to get this on here by myself. So that should be fun. And the bench is super solid. It's got like no rock to it. There's a little, little bit of rock this way, but I think if I add one more of these panels to the backside where you can't see it, it'll really sure it up. And now onto assembling the machine. This process is pretty simple. I've assembled like four of these at this point. So we're going to use this Festool stainer to give me a hand and mount it right on top of these rails. Then I'm just going to snug up all these bolts and I'll actually tighten them down once I get the thing fully assembled. And then we're going to slap the BPZ on here. I don't know exactly where it's going to go, so we're just going to get it close enough for now. And then the arm for the Masso screen, this is actually aluminum. And now I'm going to use all my strength to kind of center this on the bed as best I can. And then I'll just lock down one foot and work my way around the machine after I ensure everything's square and even. And once I get the two front feet locked down, I'll shove the rail all the way back to ensure the back feet are properly spaced so nothing binds when it moves all the way to the back. And now to unbox the Maxo and hook everything up. Super excited to try this thing out. This is what makes the machine the elite. Brand new brains for the entire operation. Hooking up the cables was pretty easy, everything was labeled. I'll clean up this rat nest a little later, I just wanted to get everything running to play with this thing. Now that everything's plugged in, we'll do a quick test to make sure all the motors and everything are running how they should. Everything seemed to be right, so let's move on to the Pwn Spindle. We went with the 80 millimeter 2.2 kilowatt Pwn spindle and this thing is a beast. I'm still guessing on the Z height along with where the spindle is going to sit because until I get the waste board on there it's hard to actually know. And then we're just going to pop open these drag chains and feed the power cable through. Now I'm going to work my way around the entire machine and mark out where the waste board is going to go. Just marking each corner where the spindle touches and then just drawing a line. Now I'll know the rough parameters of where the machine can cut and where not to put the waste board. And I'm a T-track kind of guy, so I don't want to mess with any of them threaded inserts, so we're just going to space these out evenly inside of them cutting parameters. And I also highly recommend you get one of these self-centering spring-loaded bits. They help a ton for drilling straight, clean holes in the center of these T-tracks. Then I'll use two drills, one with the self-centering bit and one with a regular Phillips head. Exactly two Ugga Uggas per screw and everything lines up perfect. Then to just rip down my half sheet of MDF, since it's a 4x4 machine, it's an easy half sheet, cut it into the proper lengths and we're good to go. I'm not going to go into super detail here since I've got like three videos on how I do my waste boards. So swing by our channel and check those out if you want more information on that.
Then I went around and marked out all the screw locations so I can ensure that all the screw holes are even, and then I used this uh, countersink bit to pre-drill all the holes and to ensure the screw head sits low enough to where I won't clip it when I surface my machine. Then these quick connect hoses are wonderful on top of this pwn spindle. I actually swipped out the hose with some silicone hose because the stuff that came with it was super stiff and I was talking to Hamilton and he said he had a hard time wrestling it. I guess the advantage would be that it wouldn't kink, but it's just, it was just too hard to manage. So I just went with the silicone tubing as it's easy to bend and move. I need to figure out a better way to manage the tubes because they don't fit inside the drag chain. So now we're going to move on to making the reservoir for my fluid as this is a water-cooled spindle. This is just 50-50 coolant. It was like 8 bucks, and then I got this waterproof tote for like 12 at Menards. And then it's just essentially a fish pump inside of it. And then we're going to try out this Pwn spindle. I couldn't get all the pieces to kind of work with the Elite, so I kind of had to hodgepodge something else together. And then I'm going to build some sort of arm to manage all this, but I don't know exactly how I'm going to do it yet, so I just tied an eye bolt to the ceiling and it's a little shoddy, but it works. Then surfacing the wasteboard and adding the grid, I got a little aggressive when I surfaced it, a little too much taken off of there, so I kinda depleted the life of it out the gate, but it works. Now that we have everything assembled, we'll do a quick overview to hopefully answer any questions you guys have about the machine and the setup. First off, the bench. I went with this over the QCW Onefinity version, just because I have multiple benches like this in the shop and I kinda wanted it to all match. I have two, three, this is my fifth bench. And another thing for me was the storage. I have, there's a ton of storage underneath here. I can add drawers or whatever I want versus the QCW bench is just open. You could build the cabinets going underneath it, but I just, again, I just like these benches. So another thing would be price. Uh, they're roughly the same price. By the time you buy the bench, the plywood, three sheets of plywood, and then the two by fours, they pretty much cost the same. So I would say it's definitely up to you. So we'll give it a quick like shake just to kind of show you guys how rigid it is. These side panels help a lot. So it does have a little bit of play, but overall it's pretty solid. I'm really not worried at all. That one over there is on wheels and I don't really have any issues. And that one shakes more than this one. Um, pretty much anything you do is going to have a little bit of play unless you build like a steel frame bench. I've also seen guys in the Onefinity group uh, just put two lags into the wall just so it really eliminates that shake. So the Craig, it's a 64 by 64 Craig bench and the top is 66 by 66 and it's like perfect. I'll do a couple shots and show you guys how it looks all the way around it. So power consumption. How much power does this thing use? I have mine on three circuits. I have one 220 circuit for the spindle. That's on a 20 amp circuit and it draws about 10. And then the Masso is on its own unit because you don't want to put the brains of the machine on the same circuit as like the router or the uh, dust collection because it can give it a lot of feedback and static electricity and it can just cause weird things to happen, missteps, and just don't want to deal with any of that. So you could put the dust collection and the router on its own circuit if you wanted. Again, I have mine on three circuits. The mass is on its own, the spindle's on its own, and then the dust collector's on its own circuit. So bare minimum two circuits. I wouldn't try to run everything on the same circuit. Okay, so how much is all this going to cost? This exact setup is going to cost you about the bench. So this, I'm just summarizing all this. I'm not doing like actual like nickels and dimes. This is just rough numbers. So the bench cost me about $500 again with the bench, three sheets of plywood and some two by fours. We'll say five, six hundred dollars. The machine, the machine itself is forty two hundred dollars with the stiffy. And then we have the spindle. I went with the Pwn spindle. This will run you about a thousand dollars. You can get cheaper versions for about five hundred or you can get a Makita router. That's a hundred dollars. So then I had the dust collection. I went with the Rockler dust collection. That was about $700 with the canister filter. You can run the, like a smaller Fiend vac that'll cost you like 400 bucks or just a cheap shop vac, it'll even be fine. And then we'll just say extras is like $100 because I'm gonna add a PVC fence along with other random fences and clamp down methods and this sheet for the wasteboard. So in total, you're going to spend about $6,500 for something like this, for the Elite Series 4x4 machine. You can get the smaller versions for cheaper. The Stiffy will save you some money if you don't buy the Stiffy. Um, the Masso unit, compared to their other older units, is going to cost an additional like $1,000. So I would say bare minimum to get a decent CNC, you're going to spend three to $4,000. Again, this is about $6,500 for this total setup right here. So I also have a Journeyman over there, which is the... Uh, 
like the original journeyman with the regular controller and all that. Um, I will do a comparison video where I'll go in depth on the differences of each machine and why you should buy this one or that one or what will fit you best. But for sake of the video, we're just going to kind of glaze over the kind of the highlights of the machine. So first off, we have the Maso unit. And this is, this is a huge upgrade from their last machine. Again, it's an additional $1,000, but the stuff this thing can do is crazy. You can run a fourth access. They don't have that available yet. You could kind of hodgepodge one together. And there's just a ton of other features crammed in there that that other machine can't do. You can set multiple zeros. You can, you can even do like a trace feature to kind of trace your piece to make sure it's lining up where you want it. It can recall when you shut the machine off to where it was last. You can start in the middle of G code and there's just a ton of features in there. Another huge upgrade is the closed stepper motors. The other one has open stepper motors. So all it does is send them power versus these closed stepper motors send signal back to the Maso unit. So it knows if it skips a step or something else happened to the machine while it's carving. Another thing it has that the other machine doesn't is proximity switches. So it has actual homing switches versus the other machine has stall homing. So this is just a lot more accurate than the other one in the homing aspect. Um, it's also got stiffer rails. I mean, granted, it's a 4x4, so it's stiffer. Um, I'm not, I mean, I've seen Onefinity post videos of how much harder it can go. I haven't spent much time cutting this thing. I literally just set it up, and we'll kind of dive into that in future videos. I'm also going to cut a couple cutting boards on this. That's going to be my next video. I have two inlay cutting boards. People really like those, so we're going to do that and just show off the accuracy and the power of the machine. And then I'm running the, I'm running the Pone 80 millimeter, 2.2 kilowatt spindle. This thing is great. It's way better than the Hu Yang HY spindle I have in that machine. Um, the VFD, way better setup. You can actually turn the knob. I hated the knob on that thing. And then for, we're doing water cooled. I honestly don't know if the water cooled's needed. It's just what I had on the other machine. So that's just what I got with this machine because it was what I was comfortable with. Um, so maybe in the future, if I ever change or upgrade, I'll go with an air cool just to have an opinion on that and see if it matters. But for coolant, this is just what I, I didn't use water because the water can get gross, kind of like a fish tank. It gets scummy. This is just antifreeze coolant. It was like $8 a jug. I got it at Menards. It's just what they had. Um, so that's what's surging through the veins of the spindle. Um, so highly recommend the spindle. We have a link in the description. You get 5% off if you go with that spindle. But again, you don't need a spindle. The Makita router is plenty for just starting out and doing all that. It does look a little ridiculous on this big Foreman Elite though. I will say that. Dust collection. I went with the Dust Right from Rockler. Um, this thing is great. It's 650 CFMs. Um, CFMs, it's kind of hard to judge because ShopX have high CFMs, but it's a different kind of pull than something like that. Um, this is more than enough for me. I got to like figure it out because it's kind of just kind of shoddy at this point. But um, we're running the the Pwn Dust Boot. Not sure how I feel about it yet because it's coming out of the back, so it's just a little different setup than I'm used to because I'm used to using the, the Suck It Dust Boot and I have no complaints on that one. Um, so maybe I'll try a couple different Dust Boots here in the future just to kind of find one I really like because I never really, I haven't really tried anything outside of the Suck It Dust Boot. Um, also, this has a filter. You don't have to get the filter, but the filter is a huge must. I'll show you the wall next to my other unit over there. You can see all the fine particles that leaks out, and that's the stuff you don't want to breathe in. That's the stuff you want to collect, and it just doesn't collect. I have a ShopFox version of that over there, and it's only like 540 CFMs. So I'm super excited to have this bigger, better dust collection in this corner over here. So this doesn't come with the remote controller like the other machine does. The Maso just won't run with that, but it does, you can get a pendant that like you spin a little thing, which I'll probably get one. They're a couple hundred bucks, so they're pretty expensive. Um, another thing this can't do is you can't control this with Wi-Fi. So on the other machine, you can run it on your laptop and kind of do everything like that. The only thing you can do with the laptop on this machine is send files to it. Everything else needs to be done in the Maso unit. Okay, so we're going to do a quick power up cycle and then just kind of go through the basics of the Maso and the few things I know so far. So first off, it powers up way faster than the other machine does. And then there's a few safety features. And then now we're going to double tap this to home it. And then after it homes, we'll just run through the tabs in here. Okay, so we'll start F1. This is the first tab. This is like the brains. Most people aren't going to do anything in here. I have no business even being in here. <clears throat> 
So in here, this is where you control your spindle, your vacuum, you can turn all that on in here. Um, we'll go to MDI. So you can set up a parking position, so after you cut your job, you can push park and it'll go wherever you want to set it. I set mine to the back right corner. So just like that, after a carb, I can just click that button and it'll go up and over. And then we'll just bring it back over here just to show you, go to home, go to all home accesses. So then it'll just bring it back over here. So there's also this dry run feature. So like if you use a laser with light burn, there's a trace feature in there. So this will run the first path to show you exactly where it's going to carve. So if you really want to line up that V carve perfect, this dry run will do that for you without actually carving it. Super excited to try that. I haven't tried that yet. Okay, we'll get out of here. So jobbing or job and probing. So this is where you would, so there's continuous mode. So this just allows you to move the machine. And then there's step mode, so you can kind of do the same thing in like precise increments like that. Um, continuous mode scary. If you're trying to like set your Z, I actually bit into the wasteboard. I thought it was in step mode, but it was in continuous, so it dropped a lot faster than I anticipated. Um, this would be for the fourth access. We don't have that yet. This is where you would set all your Z and X, Y, Z zeros. This would be bits if we had a bit changer. And then here you can set multiple zeros so you can set up multiple jigs and fixtures on the machine. Parking, this is where I set my parking to the back right corner. And here you could actually set, you could create basic G code in here. So if you want to just surface your race board, you could go to face cut and then set in all the parameters and it'll spit out a G code. So you can do basic stuff in here. Um, I don't know if I'll use this, but it's a cool feature. This is where you would load your file. So you'd use this flash drive to put your files on here, or you could use the computer to send them over via Wi-Fi. Um, then you can also, I don't know where it is right now, but you can also change the feed rate while carving. You can lower it, but you can't raise it. So you kind of have to account for that in your carve. So yeah, that I means that's pretty much the basics of this massive unit. Then we're going to go ahead and cut something on this machine just to break it in. I've, I've been on a 3D modeling kick, so I figured a great first carve would be a spoonchula. I totally guessed on all the feeds and speeds. After several carves, I'll be able to dial these in. All right. So I carved this entire side in seven minutes. So that means I could do both sides in under 15. So I did get a little bit of chatter. I, I ramped everything up from what I normally would. So I don't know if that's just me going too hard or if it's the tiny bit of play in my bench. So we're still learning. But I did the finishing at 220 and 7% step over. And then I did the roughing at 150 and 0.15 depth per pass with the 40% step over. So yeah, we'll flip it and cut the other side. There's a bunch of things that could lead to chatter or skipping. It's just something I got to figure out with a little bit of trial and error. Again, first carve. All right, here's the spoonchula, file available on our website. I carved this in just under 15 minutes. I'm going to have to dial it back a little bit on the finishing pass. We did get a little bit of chatter, but I can sand that out. And just because you can go 400 inches per minute doesn't mean it's always the best solution. So I would ramp it up a little more on the roughing. I don't care if there's a little chatter. And then I would slow it down a little bit on the finishing to really clean that up. All right, video is done. Super happy with how this turned out. Cut it in 15 minutes. That's super impressive. I got to dial it back a little bit, but overall I'm super happy with it. The other machine takes about 22 minutes to carve this same file, which is available on our website. I also have a course on how to do two-sided carvings. If you want any specific videos on this, let me know in the comments. I'll do a video on the Journeyman and the Elite, comparing them side to side. If you want a video on like the spindle compared to the, the Pwn spindle to the Huyang spindle. Um, I have two cutting board inlay videos coming up. And then I'll probably do a video on figuring out all my dust collection just because I think that's kind of interesting and I get a lot of questions about what dust collection people should buy. 
And that's the end of the video, guys. Hope you all have a good day, and I hope you learned something.